we're going to get started with the next leg of the, the presentation. My name is Amy Krakauer, and I'm the chair of the Patient Advisory Board for Design International. You guys are too kind. Uh, I'm pleased to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Satish Raj. Dr. Raj is a researcher and clinician at the Vanderbilt University's Autonomic Dysfunction Center, where he focuses on the study of POTS and neurally mediated thinking. Say that five times fast. We are delighted to have him as a member of our medical advisory board. Please give him a warm welcome. Thank you, uh, Amy and, and Lauren, for well, starting this group and having this meeting. So let me put in um, a shameless plug for you guys, hoping that this will endear me to you for the rest of the, the session. So this group probably would not have gotten started without the initiative of, of the executive who probably dragged along. But the reality is that the success of the group is probably no more dependent on them than on you. Right? The reality is what they have is the force of people that are interested in uh, wanting to be engaged and can engage and menace and threaten uh, government bureaucrats. Um, and that's not something they can do themselves. So uh, give yourselves a round of applause for, for Like I said, shameless self-promotion. So uh, for this session, I'm not sure if I'll accomplish what um, Lauren asked me to do. I believe she sent email instructions for what she wanted me to talk about. And I think it consisted of the following, point one, POTS, two, all of it, three, talk fast. Um, so, so we tried to extend the session a little bit and we, we put in some stuff, but clearly it's not uh, totally realistic to, to go after it all. But hopefully we'll give you, we'll touch on different areas. If there are things that come across as totally baffling, um, you have two choices, either put your head down, ignore it, and hope I get onto something less baffling, or feel free to yell out and ask a question. Um, having stood in the back for the better part of the morning, I can tell you the acoustics are such that from the audience point of view, when you're speaking forward to me, um, I might be able to hear you, others won't, so yell if you're gonna do that. So um, we start with a case, and this probably won't be entirely unfamiliar to many of you, but it's a patient that I saw a few years ago. Um, at the time, she was 26 years old. Um, she was a single white female, sort of like a movie, um, and worked in the music industry. Given that I, I live in Nashville, or I work in Nashville anyway, um, that's not entirely unsurprising. So she was well until she was diagnosed with a pneumonia. Um, at least that was the label given. She was treated with inhalers at first, and then she went on to develop spells of tachycardia. So she went to see a cardiologist, you know, you have something wrong with your heart rate or rhythm, seems like a reasonable place to go. And he wanted to do an EP study and uh, possibly with a view to performing an ablation. For those of you that don't know what this is, it involves, it's a, it's a fluoroscopy x-ray based procedure where you put tubes up through the groin into the heart and do all sorts of cool things. Um, she didn't like the idea of that and so she went to see another cardiologist who performed a tilt table test um, that ultimately uh, led to a different diagnosis and, and at the time her associated symptoms were lightheadedness, precinct be the feeling of almost fainting on standing, intermittent chest pains, uh, problem with brain fog or mental clouding, and, and profound fatigue. So during, um, so she ultimately underwent an orthostatic challenge, so she was put upright for 10 minutes, as part of an autonomic test panel. This, is, this, this testing is actually when she eventually came to us at Vanderbilt. Um, and you can see here that, you know, when she's lying down, when she's lying down for 15 minutes, her heart was 73 beats per minute, blood pressure was quite reasonable. Within one minute of standing, the heart rate had gone up um, over 30 points. In fact, it continued to climb. By the end of 10, by the end of five minutes, actually, she was almost 50 points, 50 beats per minute above where she started. So she was deemed to have orthostatic tachycardia and in the context of other symptoms diagnosed with POTS. So the first question, I guess, that we wanted to try and address is what is it? So the, the conventional definition um, that's still used was uh, developed by Bill Lowe of Mayo. Um, that's not to say, and this was actually in the mid-90s, that's not to say that this syndrome didn't exist before then. In fact, if you look at the history, uh, history of medicine literature, there are lots of reports going back to the Civil War where there was something called soldiers' hearts because uh, it caused to be treated the Marshall soldiers who had the best medical care at the time. 
you know, found a lot of people actually have this with the cytotactic cardio. But nonetheless, it, the syndrome is, is a bit nebulous and you can sort of grab your hands around parts of it. And what we currently call POTS, the criteria come, come um, from Bill Flow, and that's the most often cited. And this requires several things. It requires an excessive increase in heart rate on standard. Now, it's important to recognize that it is normal for the heart rate to increase on standard. It's part of the adaptation to standing up um, required. I, I believe it was this morning we sort of heard about all the bad things that happened to you in terms of fluid shifts and all that. When you stand up, well, the way, the reason we don't all faint and feel like crap, actually, when we stand up is that the autonomic nervous system kicks in and does a bunch of things. And part of what it does is increase the heart rate a little to maintain cardiac output. Um, in the last couple of years, people have reassessed this criteria, especially in kids, because it's been well known for some time that there's an age dependence where a young person normally has more of the static type of cardiac and that decreases with age through decades. So one could argue that even in adults, having a set heart rate criteria that's fixed without adjustment for age is probably not perfect, but it is what it is. But certainly in the kids, I think now most people require at least a 40 beat increase, and that's because over half the kids, healthy, presumably healthy kids, actually had an increase of over 30 in a study performed uh, out of Mayo. This is largely in the absence of orthostatic hypertension. It's not to say that occasionally blood pressure can't drop, but what you want to avoid are, you know, if I gave one of you a GI bleed, for example, and you, are you stretching or? No, I'm um, <laughs> if, if you had a GI bleed and lost a lot of blood, your pressure would fall, and, and part of the body's adaptation to that, a normal physiologic adaptation is to increase your heart rate. So we, we don't want to call that pause, right? So the whole idea is this is an excessive increase in heart rate in the absence of another very obvious reason why the heart rate would go up is, is normal adaptation. Um, and there will have to be symptoms associated with it. Ultimately, the S in POT stands for syndrome, which means there's a bunch of symptoms and things that make you look a certain way, look like another group of people that you see. Um, and the symptoms, the cause probably varies. At least some we think are due to sympathetic nervous system activation, and a lot of these are, a lot of these symptoms, but not all, are worse with upright posture and better when you get back down. Um, and this is a chronic disorder. I mean, we've always, we traditionally used a, uh, a cutoff of six months. Um, some have used three months. But what we're trying to do is eliminate uh, acute illnesses that can often present with orthostatic tachycardia. I would argue that if you went to any of your healthy friends and you know hung out with them until they got a really bad cold or the flu, and when they were sick went to torment them by measuring orthostatic vitals, that a lot of them would actually have orthostatic tachycardia and may even have a lot of the symptoms that we associate with POTS. There's really nothing served by labeling these people with POTS. I mean, this is part of an adaptation related to the acute illness. That what distinguishes what we call POTS, the patients with what we call POTS, is that it doesn't get better. Right? It doesn't go away you know, fairly rapidly. Right? So it has to be a chronic disorder. So this slide, and I think you have all of these slides in your, in your book, um, but this slide lists several of the common symptoms broken down into cardiac and non-cardiac symptoms. So, so I think some of the cardiac symptoms are pretty, pretty obvious. You know, you have a very fast heartbeat, you can feel it. You can get very rapid palpitation, rapid sensation of your heart beating. It can be associated with shortness of breath. It can often be associated with chest discomfort, the cause of which is, is still poorly understood. It's often associated with lightheadedness. Um, but there are a whole series of non-cardiac symptoms as well. Um, a high percentage of our patients complain of mental clouding or brain fog, trouble concentrating, trouble thinking. We'll get into that a little bit more. A very high percentage have headaches of various sorts, often diagnosed as migraines. Um, nausea, tremulousness, worse often with upright posture can uh, be associated with this. And then there are symptoms that aren't as clearly positional. About 40% of our patients meet criteria for chronic fatigue syndrome, but almost everyone reports fatigue as a significant problem. A high percentage report sleep problems that probably relate actually to the fatigue um, and, and quality of life issues that I'll get into. And almost universally there is an element of exercise intolerance, which I think there's actually a whole separate talk on the issue of exercise, if I'm not mistaken, but we'll touch on that briefly. Um, but it's an important aspect of care that we need to address. So this slide is just a quick introductory slide pointing out um, some of the key physiologic features. We have a tilt table test of the patient with POTS on the left and the healthy subject on the right. We have three channels. The top one is heart rate, blood pressure continuously measured in the middle and the tilt angle. You can see the table went up, the table went down, both cases. 
you focus on the control subject, you can see that the normal response to tilting up is that the heart rate goes up a little and, and it continues to drift up for the duration of what I believe is a 30 minute tilt. Blood pressure went up a little and basically hung out there until we put the table down. In the POTS patient, the most striking feature is that when the table went up, the heart rate went up not a little, but it went up a lot. And certainly by the time the table went down, and this I don't think, this patient didn't make it 30 minutes because exactly how long it was, the heart rate actually was 185. Right, so you can certainly appreciate there's at least a quantitative, not qualitative difference. The blood pressure, interestingly, if you look at the average, probably isn't that different. There's certainly a slightly different qualitative pattern. There's sort of more spikiness where it goes up and then it falls and recovers, falls and recovers, and we see that a fair bit. I think Mayo has reported that in some of their papers as well. But the average blood pressure fundamentally didn't go down. Right, so this isn't it's just an issue of a compensation for a drop in pressure. You know, in one of our earlier studies, um, actually where those slides came from, we actually looked at symptoms, we asked patients to rate their symptoms every few minutes while on tilt. And we had the POTS patients and, and healthy control subjects, which basically means Vanderbilt grad students. <laughs> um, and what you can see here is that the control subjects, you know, for the most part during the tilt, they felt okay. Occasionally they had sort of a, you know, low-grade symptoms, it got better, it went up and down a little bit. But fundamentally, they were relatively symptomatic, at least hyposymptomatic. The POTS patients in red, almost immediately on tilt, became fairly symptomatic. In fact, it wasn't unusual within the first couple of minutes for the patients to tell me that they were going to faint. They weren't going to make it. And they keep telling me that for 30 minutes. <laughs> Interestingly, in this study, we had more survival. So more people make it through the 30-minute tilt in the POTS group than in the healthy control group. Okay. So POTS fundamentally is not a fainting disorder. It's a pre-fainting disorder, an almost fainting disorder. Now, some people will faint. I mean, a few of the patients did faint. Of the patients with POTS that didn't make it, though, half of them didn't faint. Half of them just said, I've had enough. Stop the tilt. They just felt horrible. Right? So it's, it's certainly a disorder of orthostatic tone. It's not necessarily a fainting disorder, though. So um, the prevalence estimate that we're using is about a half a million people in the US. The reality is these numbers are made up. Um, the most quoted figure is uh, from an article written by my, my supervisor, David Robertson, at Vanderbilt years ago, um, based on some back of the napkin map. The, the reality is this is very difficult. It's a very difficult figure to get your arms around because there's not an easy way to determine that. There's obviously issues of recognition, of diagnosis, and even when physicians diagnose it, you know, if you're looking, if you want to know how many patients with diabetes there are, there are lots of good administrative databases where there's a code for diabetes, and if you pay Medicare 100 bucks, they'll give you this big database, you can play with it, come up with numbers. Well, the problem is there's not a code for POTS, and even in our center where we have five physicians that may see patients with POTS, we all code it differently. Because the fundamental goal in coding these diagnoses is to get paid and for someone to leave you alone, right? I mean, there's, not, there's no other real purpose to it. Um, and so, you know, I may code it as a tachycardia NOS, other people code it as a dysautonomia disorder, disorder codes. People have different codes for it, and these codes also represent other things. So there's no easy way to get a really good handle on what the numbers are. Um, certainly, I think at, at our centers, the sense is that there are more people out there. I don't know if that's really an increase in the prevalence of POTS, or an increase in the recognition of POTS, or an increase in the recognition of our centers. But it's, it's probably some combination of that. The vast majority of patients are female. The exact numbers may vary. In some of our papers, you know, over 90% of the subjects are female. I think overall the truth is probably somewhere in the four to one to five to one range. So about 80 to 85% are female. This slide says they're typically age 20 to 50. That's a bit of a lie. That's because we're an adult only center. Um, so we <laughs> happily ignore, you know, all of the positives of under 18, which we know exists. But I think it's probably truthful to say that there's, you know, a big bump around the time of puberty. So probably around 13 or 14. It's actually, I think, pretty uncommon below that. It does happen, um, but I don't think it's that common until around puberty where the incidence picks up. And, and this disorder is associated with a lot of functional disability, and we'll get into a little bit of what that might mean. So one of the questions that, that comes up, and there's certainly people that would argue that it's, it's largely a psychiatric disorder. Um, and so we did a study years ago um, at Vanderbilt. It was actually done by my wife, and she's a research fellow in psychiatry, to try and address this question. And this involved basically a structured assessment um, of patients that came into our research unit using what we call SKIDS, which with the DSM-4TR basically is a structured way of coming up with psychiatric 
see if you meet psychiatric <coughs> diagnostic criteria, as well as a handle, a bundle of psych, um, psychometric tests looking at anxiety, depression scores, things like that. And really, um, you didn't have the time or space to go into all the details here. I think it's um, fair to summarize it by saying there wasn't an increased incidence of DSM or TR diagnostic rate. There wasn't an increased incidence of major depression or generalized anxiety disorder or anything like that with POTS patients. Um, are there POTS patients that are crazy? Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's no question. Uh, I'm always fascinated that you know some patients take the whole concept very personally, and, and I understand it to some extent. The truth is, if you went into a heart failure clinic or a renal, uh, definitely in the renal failure clinic, you know you're going to find crazy people as well, right? There's no reason why POTS should be protected from psychiatric diagnosis. Um, so one of the things they found that was interesting is so one of the, the psychiatric areas that often comes up most, I think is that of anxiety. Patients, you know, are perceived as very anxious. Um, and there, there are actually probably a couple of reasons for that, but one of the interesting things that was done in the study, um, which I can't claim too much credit for because I didn't design it, was that they actually used two different tools to assess anxiety. So one tool they used was something called the Beck Anxiety Inventory, which is a very standard, commercial, easily available tool. Uh, and they used something called the Anxiety Sensitivity Index. So using the Beck Anxiety Inventory, the POTS patients came across as moderately anxious. Using the Anxiety Sensitivity Index, which is shown here, the POTS patients actually scored in the mildly anxious category, which was more than the group of normals, which basically were screened to be psychiatrically normal. Um, as an aside, my wife assures me I would not have qualified. <laughs> <laughs> but interestingly, the, the patients, you know, did actually come across as more anxious than the general population. So why the discordance between the Beck Anxiety Inventory and the Anxiety Sensitivity Index? And the simple explanation is it's probably based on the questions that are asked. So in Beck, um, you actually score points for symptoms like palpitation, which can be associated with anxiety, but I suspect that if we did a show of hands, the vast majority of you have experienced that, and we think that may be more directly related to some of the other things going on with POTS in terms of sympathetic activation and such. So you're actually getting points off the top for things that may have nothing to do with anxiety. The Anxiety Sensitivity Index is designed to ask more questions about cognitive anxiety, not so much how you feel, but how you're thinking about certain things. Um, and the anxiety level is a bit lower with that tool. So how you measure stuff makes a difference when you're sort of looking at the summary. So the one thing that did come out as abnormal in the POTS group was the issue of inattention. So, it, and so looking compared to the normal population and compared to the background, there was a higher level of inattention using the Connors um, attention rating score. It wasn't as high as the ADHD population, but it was higher than normal. Uh, and this is something that uh, there's a, a follow-up study looking at brain fog that, um, that we've done and we're in the process of that we've submitted, just submitted the publication. We're waiting for rejection right now. <laughs> um, trying to understand this, but this raises an interesting issue. I think a lot of POTS patients, when they come to me, will complain that their memory is bad. I can't remember things. What this suggests is the problem might not truly be memory. The problem might be attention, you know, holding on to your attention at the time to process the memory. And that may actually be the issue. There's sort of a lot of things going on, and if you want to process, you know, you put your keys down, and if you want to remember what it was, you have to sort of have that tension to focus that process the memory before you move on, and that may be part of what's lacking. Either way, this is being looked into a little bit further um, as we speak. Another study in this regard that's actually um, was very elegant was done at Mayo by Mike Joyner's group. Um, so the question again was, is the heart rate driven by anxiety? And so what they did is they did a study using lower body negative pressure. So think of lower body negative pressure as um, tilt simulation without the tilt. So basically, it's, it's, it's what it sounds like. You stick the lower half of someone into a coffin-like device um, and hook it up to a vacuum cleaner, or sorry, an expensive medical suction device. <laughs> we did it with this, an Electrolux vacuum cleaner. Um, and, and, you know, in a graded way, you suck, you have negative pressure, so you suck blood into the legs. Right, so you're simulating this orthostatic challenge that, that was alluded to when you stand up or with tilt. And you can see that um, with lower body negative pressure, the POTS patients started a slightly higher heart rate in the control group, and as they started sucking blood, their heart rate accelerated at a faster rate, went up at a faster rate in the control group, while the blood pressure remained fairly stable. 
Now, when they did this study, they actually did it with um, mask pants on. So mask pants, I don't think are used as commonly now, but they're sort of old trauma pants that you could put over the legs and inflate, and I think it was used to try and splint legs, for example, if you fractured a femur, fractured your leg, to try and get you to the hospital without it being in too many pieces. Right, but it provides, it, there's a big air bubble around the legs when you blow it up. So they did the study with the mask pants deflated, and then they inflated the mask pants in the study again, and still the heart rate's a bit higher at rest than the control subjects, but the heart rate didn't actually go up in either group. Right, so when the legs were protected from the suction, when the blood wasn't sucked into the legs, there wasn't the increase in heart rate. The lower body pregnant pressure makes, I mean, for those of you that have the vacuum, these things make a lot of noise, right? So if this is anxiety-based, one would expect the heart rate to go up in both cases because the same noise existed. So I think this fairly elegantly showed the physiology underlying the tachycardia in this group. So uh, the summary um, from this paper was that the patients with POTS didn't have an increased prevalence of major depression or anxiety um, compared to the general population. Um, but there is something going on in terms of tension and that's being Silicon into further. So what about quality of life? Um, and some of this work was done with um, Kanika Bagai at our center. And we actually, and, and she's actually a sleep person, so this is actually one of our early studies looking at sleep issues and thoughts. But as part of that, we, we used a very standard um, quality of life assessment tool, the SF36. Um, and the data here isn't from our study, it, it just uses published uh, published reports in different disorders that are generally acknowledged to have a pretty poor quality of life. So patients with chronic back pain uh, and patients on hemodialysis. So patients that are uh, end stage renal blood that basically have to show up three days a week and spend half a day with their favorite nephrology staff. Um, and you can see that the, the, where their quality of life are for back pain and the dialysis, I'm sorry, I'm sorry that the boxes both look white. And we superimposed our data from, from our POTS cohort to build out the survey. Right, you can see it's comparable with the dialysis patients. The study doesn't address why or what to do about that, but it certainly does point out that there is, for whatever cause, a significant disability associated with this, where patients feel the quality of is very poor, both in physical domains in terms of what you can do and, and mental domains in terms of how you react to such. In fact, as I mentioned, this was primarily done to try and objectively see if we could capture sleep problems, certainly using, um, question, using questionnaires that have been previously validated. Um, and one of them was the Medical Outcome Studies Sleep Score, and they have a summary problem index. They look at a whole series of individual symptoms, but they, look, they have a summary score. And when we regressed this against either the physical subscore of the SF36 or the mental subscore of the SF36, in both cases, we found that about 60% of the variance in quality of life, and this is including POTS patients and our healthy control subjects, which included some Vanderbilt employees as well as Vanderbilt grad students this time, um, was accounted for by their variance in sleep quality. Right, so the more sleep problems you have, the poor your quality of life. And we could explain 60% of it in both cases by their sleep. So this gets into the whole question of, well, what causes POTS, or why do patients that have POTS have POTS? And, and I think, um, this is probably not new to any of you, but I think it's important to state again that POTS isn't a disease. POTS is a syndrome. There are lots of different ways to end up looking like you have POTS. Um, this is the point made by David Robertson, who started our autonomic center uh, some time ago and, and still provides leadership for it. One way to think about it is like a fever. Right? I think we all appreciate that fevers can be bad. We all appreciate that lowering the fever might help you feel better. But ultimately, there are a gazillion ways that you can get a fever, and the you know some will go away by itself, and some won't, and some will respond. But I mean, if you want to try and get the underlying root, some you have to actually sort of dig in um, and try and find that. And the truth is that I think we're still early in the uh, process of trying to understand the orthostatic tachycardia, the POTS part, more clearly. So. Um, I don't know if you guys are aware of the old parable of, of the blind man and the elephant, but this is sort of the, the challenge in POTS, right? So the parable goes like this. It was it, it's credited to um, John Godfrey Saxon, who's um, British, but the reality is this parable sort of covers um, almost every religion 
in the Indian subcontinent. They claim it is wrong with minor variances, but like all good things from the Indian subcontinent, the Brit came, took it to credit for it. <laughs> um, so he's, he's credited ultimately. But, but one version goes like this. It was um, the six men of Hindustan to learning much inclined, who went to see the elephant, though all of them were blind. That each by observation might satisfy his mind. They concluded that the elephant is like a wall, a snake, a spear, a tree, a fan, a rope, depending on where they touch. And this is one of the challenges when you're trying to study and understand plots, is that I think different research groups and different people come at it with, from different sides, with their interests. And so there are different things that are focused on in study X or study Y. And just, you know, that's... <laughs> So there are um, lots of ways one can break up you know, the pathophysiologies of plots, and I'll, I'll touch on this. This is not meant by any means to be a complete list. Um, but, but terms that you may have come across at various times include mast cell activation disorder, um, partial autonomic neuropathy, um, problems with like, blood flow, problems with blood volume or hypovolemia, um, a hyperadrenergic state or inc a state of increased sympathetic tone. And again, this can be due to releasing too much or not clearing too much, we'll talk about that a little. Um, and, and a little bit about antibodies, because Lauren really wanted to hear about antibodies. <laughs> so, um, so mast cells are a uh, type of white cell, white blood cell we all have, that are important, important, important in allergic responses. So if a bee stings you and you swell up and you turn red and all these things happen, that's because these mast cells get activated and release stuff they have. And the stuff they release there are actually a whole bunch of things, but the, big, the biggies are histamine and a uh, certain type of prostaglandin, prostaglandin D2. Um, there are some patients that present to us with POTS in whom we think have, they have flaky mast cells, which is to say the mast cells degranulate. They release their stuff in the absence of an obvious trigger. Now, the lack of it being obvious might just mean they haven't figured it out yet, but sometimes you can't figure it out. It's, it's ubiquitous, but, but certainly it's worth trying if this is an issue. And what ends up happening is they turn red and flush. They don't feel hot. Well, they do feel hot. They don't just feel hot. They literally turn red. Um, and then they get really tachycardic, which is why they came to see us. And so what we try and do to diagnose the disorder is to try and look for a metabolite of histamine in the urine that's relatively stable around the time of a bad spell. Right? There's really little point in just measuring a 24-hour urine when you're not having a spell. So what we want to know is, and then the risk metabolite is elevated. So basically, we'll get people to try and void right at the beginning of the spell if they can, and then collect the urine four hours later. So basically, all the urine in the bladder hopefully coming out is sort of from the time of the spell and not diluted out by stuff from before. Um, and so we largely diagnose it by an elevated level of this methylhistamine in the urine, elevated concentration. And the treatments for it are a little bit different. So it consists of multimodality, multimodal um, antihistamine therapy, so blocking the different histamine receptors. Um, some of the people that described it are, are very senior faculty at Vanderbilt right now, and the approach they used to use is to give a whole lot of aspirin, right? Sort of aggressive rheumatologic dose of aspirin, not that little aspirin that you take every day, but a lot of it to the point. And, and one described it as the, his approach was to give aspirin until it starts causing your, your ears to ring, um, and then back off one pill. Right, but basically sort of aggressive to try and suppress the prostaglandins that this releases. Um, but the other approach that, that uh, Ilo Biagioni has advocated and, and we tend to use more is to try and block the cycle in terms of the activation of the sympathetic nervous system. And so we use Aldemet or alpha methyl dopa to try and block the sympathetic surge. Because there's a whole feed forward mechanism where the increased sympathetic tone makes it easier to degranulate. And when the mast cells release their stuff, that actually increases sympathetic tone and probably drives the tachycardia. So the approaches are a little bit different than we may use for other patients with POTS. So the whole concept of neuropathic POTS, and this was alluded to, I think, this morning when you're hearing about all these different peripheral neuropathy type things, but is that there are probably some patients that have um, nerve damage, particularly in their legs, involving sympathetic nerves. And this may lead to an inability to squish vessels properly and return blood to the heart. Um, and this was shown in a small group of patients very elegantly and very painfully by Jonas Jacob, who looked at segmental norepinephrine spillover in the legs. This is a technique that is not only um, not ready for clinical care, but is a nuisance at academic centers to try and do. But what he was able to show is that there was a group 
these patients that had less sympathetic nervous system release of norepinephrine um, from their legs, but not necessarily the rest of them, the rest of their bodies. The reality is that's probably the, the gold standard version of the test. It's not easy to do, and so what I think a lot of people do are tests like the QSART test or sweat test, which also is a peripheral sympathetic nerve function test, but it tests a different type of sympathetic nerve. The neurotransmitter is entirely different. It's acetylcholine as opposed to norepinephrine. So some, including Philip Lowe, who developed the test, question how perfect it really is for that assessment. So it's a tough assessment to make in any individual, but in terms of you know, pathophysiologic concepts, it's, it's valuable. So there's the issue of, of leg blood flow in POTS, and this has really been championed largely by Julian Stewart, um, who's done a lot of work in stratifying his patients, often kids or young adults, um, based on, on their leg blood flow, or again, trying to address this issue of is there adequate squish or not um, in the vessels. And the details of this are less important, and the TAUs are actually entirely irrelevant to anything that you should care about. But the point that I want you to take from this is that he's able to subdivide his group into uh, patients with high flow and low flow POTS that may be more or less than what he found in his healthy volunteer. So he's able to pick up different groups of, of kids or young adults with POTS based on this technique. And I think he's now looking into whether uh, the different groups may respond differently to specific treatments. Right? So, these, these approaches are still in development and still early on, but there's, there's a method to his madness. And there can be a lot of that. So one of the things that I focused on um, in our research at Vanderbilt is the whole issue of blood volume regulation. So there was a study done, published several years ago now, um, where among other things, we looked at blood volume, we measured blood volume in POTS patients. And, and measuring blood volume is a little bit involved, it involves a nuclear Way, there are different ways of doing it, but, but most involve a nuclear medicine test. We have uh, Vanderbilt tended to use um, radio-labeled albumin, so a tiny bit of radioactive albumin, and then you basically make a few assumptions that it spreads in the plasma, which is the space where albumin is, and if you measure it quickly enough, it's not going to be taken out. And so it's, it's basically in the family indicator dye dilution techniques, okay, which is a long phrase, but the premise is simple. If you have a bucket of red dye and you dump it in a bathtub full of water, it's going to turn really red. If you take that same bucket of red dye and dump it in the Potomac, you'd be lucky to get a little tinge of pink. Right? So if you know how much red dye you've dumped in, and you can measure the concentration of the redness, for example, this red dye, in our case it's radiation, radioactivity, then you can then calculate how big the body of water that you dumped it into was. Right? So that's the premise of, of these techniques in terms of, of measuring blood volume. I would, I would make a point that you can't measure blood volume based on 24-hour urines. 24-hour urines can be very valuable in terms of looking at sodium intake and whether it's adequate or you need to increase it, but it's not a measure of blood volume. So, so the blood volume was low, but more importantly, we also looked at some of the hormones um, that regulate blood volume, so the ren plasma renin activity and aldosterone levels. So aldosterone is a hormone that we all have. That whose job that basically is to tell the kidney to hold on to more sodium, right? As, and if, if there's less aldosterone, the kidney will pee out more of the sodium. And what we found in our patients is that the aldosterone levels, while we would have expected it to be high, right? If you have a low blood volume and this is a regulatory system that's trying to correct it, you'd expect the levels to be up, it was actually low in our patients. And so we actually sort of led to some more work trying to address what the problems might be in the aldosterone, maybe that's contributing to the low blood volume that may be driving the tachycardia. And so this is a little schema of this renin angiotensin system. So you have something called angiotensinogen that renin activity, plasma renin activity, converts to angiotensin 1. It's converted by an enzyme called ACE <coughs> to angiotensin 2. This is relevant because many of you may have heard of drugs that block it. ACE inhibitors are incredibly common. And then this works at a certain receptor, the H1 receptor, in the adrenal gland to produce aldosterone, which should increase blood volume. But we certainly found several problems. So we found that the renin activity was low, the aldosterone was low, the blood volume was low, and sort of assumed that the angiotensin II level may be low as well, um, and, and we were actually wrong. Um, so Julian and, and 
first sort of found a subgroup of his low base patients that the angiotensin II level was actually high. Um, and we've since found this in sort of a larger unselected group of patients over a few years that came to our center that angiotensin II levels were quite high. And that there may be a problem um, with ACE2, an enzyme that wasn't on the picture before, uh, but is actually responsible for breaking down angiotensin II, angiotensin 1 to 7. So I don't know that there's a specific take home message for all this because right now it's a little bit of a dog's breakfast in terms of trying to understand exactly why this is all going on. The reality is that there are abnormalities in the renin angiotensin system. We're trying to parse out you know, whether there's a problem with ACE2 activity in POTS patients or not, and how this relates to the blood volume regulation. So ACE2 has only been really, it's probably described a little over 10 years ago. So scientifically, it's a much newer concept that people are still trying to get their hands around. You can read through this, but I think the top line sort of summarizes, I think, what should take from this right now. So um, what about hyperadrenergic clots, so high sympathetic tone of clots? As I mentioned, I think you can look at this in, in one of two ways. Um, you can actually have too much stimulation, right? So you have excessive nerve firing, and that's schematically shown here where you're just sort of going like crazy and stimulating the blood vessels, the, the heart and kidneys, in case the picture is different, but um, more than usual. And, and there are some people, but I think a, a fairly small minority, that have this just because. Right? There's something in their brain and they just fire like crazy. As opposed to the group with hypovolemia that may have increased sympathetic tone as an attempt at compensation, as an attempt to maintain blood pressure. <coughs> but there's another group that um, may or may not be very common, but it certainly captured um, the interest and attention of, of both physicians and, and patients, and that are, pa that are patients with decreased clearance of norepinephrine. So norepinephrine is the main neurotransmitter in the vascular part of the sympathetic nervous system. So you can fire and release a lot of norepinephrine, or you may be able to not clear it. And this stems back from um, an individual patient, actually, that's seen at Vanderbilt probably over 15 years ago now. Um, and she presented with palpitation, lightheadedness, problems with thinking when she was upright, reduced exercise capacity fatigue. I mean, this list reads like the list that I had in the, in the beginning, right? This is sort of fairly common with our POTS patients. When they studied her, what they found was they did a couple of tests. So one was muscle sympathetic nerve activity. So these are direct recordings of sympathetic nerve firing. Again, a nuisance technique to do, but it can be done in several research labs. And norepinephrine levels. And the normal response when you stand up is that you activate the sympathetic nervous system. You get a rough doubling of both. In her case, There's another figure here, there was another figure here, um, that, which showed that in her case, the um, muscle sympathetic nerve activity actually did almost double, it didn't quite double. But the norepinephrine level, instead of doubling, actually went up three to four times. Right? So there was much more norepinephrine level measurable in her blood after when she stood up than one would expect based on normal physiology. In fact, when they looked at um, norepinephrine clearance, again, this involves you know, tritiated norepinephrine in, in very painful studies, they found that clearance was decreased in her case. Right, so the problem wasn't necessarily the nerve firing too much, but when you release a neurotransmitter into a synapse, into the area where it's going to work, you have to have a way to get rid of it. The body has to have a way to get rid of it. Otherwise, you can do it once in your life. Right? So for every one of these, there are ways of getting rid of it. There are different ways depending on the nerve. Some get, just get eaten up and broken down, but um, We'll get into how it's done here. In fact, we're going to show you that with the norepinephrine synapse. So the little red dots are norepinephrine. You can see they're released into the synapse. This is what's called the presynaptic side, the release side. This is the, you know, the postsynaptic side, the business end, where these receptors do things that will trigger an increase in blood pressure or increase in heart rate, depending on where they are and what they're doing. Sorry, I'm having technical problems. Yeah, so a lot of, I apologize, but the, the action seems to disappear. The point is that a lot of these little dots, the norepinephrine, gets cleared by these transporters called NET, or norepinephrine transporters. And these are presynaptic, and so basically the, these vesicles give it, and these transporters take it away. 
Okay, so 80 to 90% of the norepinephrine actually gets sucked up back into this presynaptic terminal. The rest actually wafts off into the blood and is actually what we measure, right? So this, you're assuming steady state and what you're measuring is not the same level here, but is equivalent. So this goes up, that goes up. So the net effect, sorry, I apologize, the net net effect is an increase in sympathetic tone because every time you fire, more of this, these norepinephrine molecules hang out and get to activate postsynaptic receptors. Okay, so that's in fact what they ultimately found to be the problem in that patient. And they found that this was due to a mutation in the norepinephrine transporter gene um, that ultimately got reported. So basically one amino acid changed and caused the norepinephrine transporter to not work. Right, so she wasn't clearing it up and she effectively got a lot more. So we found a mutation, we found, had lots of patients with POTS, um, they, took this, they took this and looked in the extended family and found that some people had it and some people didn't, as you'd expect. So 8, 4, 5, 7 P is the mutation. And you can see that patients were, not patients, these are now family members, without the mutation, had a higher, or with the mutation, sorry, had a higher heart rate than those without a mutation, both when lying down as well as when standing up. Right, so this mutation was associated with tachycardia, associated with increased heart rate. So, um, you know, this is exciting stuff, right? We found the cause of POTS and we're done. Um, so, you know, we looked for this mutation um, in patients that came through for several years afterwards, and, um, you know, no one else had this mutation. <laughs> so our work wasn't quite done. Um, and, and ultimately, it, it, this is probably not a fair statement because, you know, I think this had been from a genetic point of view, we sort of figure we're done, this is not that important, although I think there is a side importance, I'm not sure I'm touching on this, if I'm touching on this or not later on, and that is that there are a lot of drugs, especially newer drugs for things like fibromyalgia and some antidepressants, whose main me mechanism of action, or a primary mechanism, if not the main one, is to block this transporter. So these are the NRI drugs, norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, and they're sometimes combined with serotonin Drugs. So they're SSRIs, which are selective serotonin inhibitors, but the newer ones are often SNRIs. So they block both the serotonin and the norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor. Um, and certainly, theoretically, based on these data and a few other studies that we've done, and practically in some patients, these aren't always well tolerated because the trade-off of whatever else good it may do for you is that it may make the tachycardia a lot worse. It's not to say you should never use it. I'm not sure that it's going to do any long-term horrible harm, but you may feel like crap. And you should at least know that going in, this may be, may be an issue. And this is knowledge that really stemmed out of work from finding this mutation in one patient. So, as I said, we just about given up hope that NET was actually important um, until a couple of years ago when there was some work came out of uh, an autonomic group in Melbourne, Australia. And what they started doing in addition to some of the other assessments are that they figured we all have too much vein in us, we don't need it all. And so they biopsied little chunks of vein from the arm of people, both POTS patients and healthy volunteers. And they published a paper just in a handful of people and, and looked for the presence of net protein, right, in, in the vein. And what they found is in the control subjects there was, you know, it was normal levels. And in the POTS patients, actually one patient had normal levels, one had subnormal levels, and several, they had trouble finding it. Right, so there was variability and, and decreased expression. So these, are, these aren't people that had the mutation that caused the net not to work, but they were producing less of the net, right? So the gene may be there, but ultimately the gene provides the possibility to do things. You have a whole bunch of steps afterwards that you have to take to get the things done. And there may, be, may well be problems going forward. And there's a little summary sort of histogram over here. So this is still one of these things that's being followed up and, and may be important, but I'm not sure that anyone can give you a cogent it is or isn't at this stage. There's a study um, published a couple of years ago out of uh, the Czech Republic where um, they had a bunch of POTS patients they put through MIBG scans and looked at their heart. So MIBG is a, is a radioactive um, chemical that is, a, I believe, a guanethidine analog, which is irrelevant to you except that it's taken up by the norepinephrine transporter. Right? So basically, it's a scan used for certain sympathetic tumors like pheochromocytoma and neuroblastomas. And the reason they do it is because it's taken up by sympathetic tissue. Though in most cases, we look for things that are 
tumorigenic and abnormal. But it's taken up and then it stays and then you wait a few hours and you take pictures and you see where it is and where it isn't. But in most people, the heart has a fair bit of sympathetic tissue and so you can do, um, you can look at the heart and look at ratios in the heart. And you can see that, uh, it's probably not brilliant here, but you can see that, you know, here you can sort of see the ring of heart. You can see the ring of heart here in a nice spec image where it lights up and that's the MIBG that's been taken up, okay? In 20% of their POTS patients that they studied, they saw this image. The heart wasn't there. It was on low images, but on the sympathetic image it wasn't there. Now they interpreted this finding as, you know, the sympathetic nerves were dead, right? That they had a, this is the partial neuropathy argument. And you know, I honestly can't tell them that they were wrong. However, another explanation could be the sympathetic nerves are there, but they're not expressing the norepinephrine transport and not able to take up the MIBG. Right, so this actually could fit with this. I imagine if you scanned these people, you would see this. Okay, so based on that data, it may represent about 20% of the group. Again, a lot of hand waving right now, still trying to understand how important this is, but, but there's more to it than the genes, the norepinephrine transporter and the response to drugs may depend on which of these groups you fall into. So, um, more recently, out of the same Melbourne group, or a similar Melbourne group, there's a, a paper looking at gene silencing in POTS, again, trying to address this issue of altered expression in the protein. Um, this is a pretty picture from it. Lauren explicitly wanted this discussed. I will tell you that, you know, even some of our DNA experts have trouble figuring out exactly what they did. It wasn't a methylation thing, but the underlying premise is that um, for genes to be read and then converted to an RNA, DNA converted to RNA and ultimately to proteins, they have to be unfolded and accessible, right? When you're, they're not being used, they're all folded and tightly packed. It's very efficient storage. And what they looked at and suggested was that the problem in, this is a small number of POTS patients, less than 10, you know, was that they weren't uncoiling properly and that may be part of the explanation for why this net gene wasn't being Right. So moving on, um, Lauren wanted a uh, discussion of the role of antibodies in POTS. Um, and and uh, we'll, talk, we'll mention three things, um, some of which I can say very little about. So one is um, the whole issue of acetylcholine receptor antibody. I think this was mentioned in a couple of talks this morning. Um, this is a, an antibody that was discovered by, uh, at Mayo years ago by Steve Bernino and, and Bond Lennon. Um, we'll talk briefly about adrenergic antibodies, and antibodies that may target the alpha and beta receptors, and um, we'll talk very, very, very briefly about the um, cardiac rapid antibodies uh, in a paper that was recently published out of the Mayo group. So the whole issue of, of this ganglionic acetylcholine receptor antibody, as I mentioned, it was discovered at Mayo, and it had, it's been shown very nicely to cause a loss of function in the autonomic ganglia, right? So in the autonomic weight station. Um, and the presentation of it is usually autonomic failure. Right? So these patients present with severe orthostatic hypotension. I believe that was a slide, there was a slide that you may see again in a moment, shown this morning from this paper by Schroeder et al., um, some of our German colleagues um, in the New England Journal a few years ago. In another paper, um, Steve Bernino and gang reported that 7 to 14 percent of POTS patients have this antibody. So there was a span of about three years where every POTS patient I saw in clinic we sent off this antibody and I get to see one positive in a POTS patient. And in fact, I know, uh, I don't know if Paula wants to wait, chime in on this, but I, but I know that uh, more recently Philip Lowe has sort of backed off on the association between POTS and this antibody because I think they're seeing less of it at Mayo now. And I can't offer a good explanation for that because we actually send our antibodies to the Mayo labs to be done, right? There are a few labs that do, we're very particular about sending it to Mayo labs to get this done. So I'm not sure what the difference is if the threshold's changed, but we don't tend to see it in the POTS group. So these are versions of the slides you saw this morning. Um, and this patient that presented with profound orthostatic hypotension and, and other issues, eye issues, and bowel issues where they thought there could be an autonomic ganglionic problem, problem in the autonomic ganglia. You can see here that 
the blood pressure dropped precipitously at first with upright tilt and, and didn't so much afterwards. Um, and the overall pattern, and, and one of the problems is they treated with plasma exchange and they got better and then they got worse. So they brought them back and treated with plasma exchange and they got better and then they got worse and they got sick of doing this. So then they started using other immunosuppressive drugs and that's sort of what we see here in terms of the overall pattern. This is the antibody pattern and this is the change in blood pressure, I believe, that, you know, that correlated with the change in antibody. It was a very elegant proof of concept study in one person. I will tell you that we don't have a lot of these people. Um, not everyone responds nearly as elegantly um, in real life, right? There are some people you can clear the antibody and their blood pressure still falls through their boots, right? And this may reflect either duration of disease and, or it may, ref it may be a true, true and unrelated. It may be that they have another reason for autonomic failure and they have the antibody and one wasn't causing the other. So, um, more recently there have been a few papers out of um, Oklahoma actually, an, endo an endocrinology group there, where they found um, that some patients with orthostatic hypotension have antibodies that stimulate alpha and beta receptors, right, so adrenergic receptors. And we see that here, they're, they're using uh, sort of stimulation assays here, uh, but basically, depending on what concentration of, of antibody they got out of the serum from people, so they drew blood and they isolated the antibody portions, and then they basically dumped it on these little reporter assays. And you know, you've got more stimulation of, in this case, the beta-2 adrenergic receptor with more antibody. And the beta-2 receptor is a vasodilating receptor, right? It causes the vessels to open up. And so their argument is maybe this was contributing to the orthostatic hypotension seen because the vessels were dilating instead of squishing on standing. They found the same thing in some people. Again, it wasn't everyone had both, but some had this, and some had an M3, a muscarinic receptor, that induces the release of nitric oxide that will cause you to vasodilate. And they found the same thing, depending on you know the more IgG you sort of dropped on this assay, you ended up getting more release of their marker, more stimulation of that receptor. And then, I guess more importantly, they took these patients and you know dropped their uh, their serum or the IgG from their serum on it, but and started giving increasing doses of blockers. So they gave propranolol, a very non-specific, old-school beta blocker, and they showed that if you blocked the beta receptor with the drug in increasing doses, you ended up getting less stimulation of that receptor, right? So it was targeting, the antibody did seem to be targeting that receptor, and that could be blocked with drugs. And similarly, with the M3 receptor, if you gave atropine, which blocks the muscarinic receptors, you have the same thing, right? So this is, so far, has nothing to do with POTS, um, but does have to do with orthostatic hypotension and shows that at least in some people, they're able to find these antibodies that directly target these receptors that may contribute to tachycardia, contribute to vasodilation, contribute to blood pressure changes. So, all of that's fine. I mean, we have these little reporter assays and little kits and they light up funny colors and give you numbers and that's great, but they show that it actually has functional issues as well. So they have this um, assay using chronosteric arteries of rats. And I don't know if you guys know what chronosteric arteries are, but suffice it to say, the rats really sacrificed their all um, for the science. Um, looks arterials where they basically, you know, dropped the IgG or the antibodies, or the IgG in this case, on and showed that these vessels opened up, right? So not only the beta-2 receptor causes vasodilation here, they're actually measuring vasodilation saying it did. And then they gave propranolol and showed that it opened up less, right, it still opened up. And then they gave a blocker, not only propranolol, but a blocker of nitric oxide and showed that it opened up less, showing that these two mechanisms both have physiologic consequences. They both actually not only stimulate the receptor, but actually work on the vessel, at least in these rats. Um, so, there's, I, unfortunately I can't say too much about this at this point because of um, embargo issues, but we've actually been working with them to try and address the issue of antibodies in, in some POTS patients. And um, it does appear that some patients do have antibodies that may be activating antibodies on some of those and some different similar receptors. So the reason for the interest in this historically is that an over, uh, overwhelming majority, 
a high percentage of POTS patients present with something that sounds like an acute viral illness, right? They were, I mean, there's not everyone, but there are a lot of people that can tell you the day they got sick and they just didn't get better, right? They thought nothing of it. I mean, one of, one of my patients sort of, you know, got sick, she was a summer student in one of the labs at Vanderbilt and sort of got sick on a Friday and said, ah, oh, 24 hour flu, I'll be at work the next day, you know, and, you know, she didn't, <laughs> right? It just didn't, never sort of came across. Now, up until now, and even now it's certainly far from proven, no one's ever been able to reliably isolate antibodies or find out what antibodies. The whole premise of the viral infection did it, your body, the immune system develops antibodies to the virus and some of those may cross-react with receptors in the body. Right? That's the whole premise of sort of an autoimmune ideology. Um, so these data are starting to suggest that we may be able, to, we may be on the verge of sort of trying to find some antibodies that may actually play a role. Is this gonna explain all of POTS? No, right, but I mean, but it, but it may well play a role in a significant percentage of people. And there's a whole series of studies planned to try and look at whether this comes and goes, whether this may explain flares, you know, patients get exacerbations and then get better, and this may relate in some way, at least partially. Okay, so I, I, there is an abstract um, about this, or at least a couple, a couple of abstracts, I think, that are being have been submitted to the American Autonomic Society meeting. The, assuming that I assume they'll be presented there, um, and there's a paper that's been submitted and rejected so far only once. Um, but I mean, this will this will be coming up probably later this year, early next year. Um, the final thing was this whole issue of, of rapt associated antibodies. So Mayo um, this year reported. Um, different proteomics profiles. So you can sort of, you know, take stuff and look at sort of little protein signatures um, in something called cardiac lipid wrap associated proteins in POTS patients compared to control subjects. So these are a family of proteins involved in cellular signaling. And, you know, I apologize and Paula may be able to help. I don't know if she was involved in these studies or not. And I'll fill those names was on the paper, although mainly from the proteomics group. I have no idea what the clinical implication of this is. Right, I mean, in the paper, this is very much written um, for a proteomics expert. There's, the clinical implications are far from clear. Basically, I think what they said is, hey, we saw something different. Um, and, that's, and that's not an unreasonable place to start. But the question then is, you know, well, are they different in things that we think might make a difference, might be important, uh, might play a role in, in physiology and regulation? And at this point, I think it's an unanswered question. There's been one paper out, I'm sure they're doing more work on it. Okay, so um, we'll try and round out with the what to do about POTS. Um, so here, lists different tests that we will do. We don't, don't, don't do everything, everyone. Ultimately, history and physical are, are the key initial. I think the history is probably the most important in POTS. Um, orthostatic vital signs are, are pretty important. It turns out you can't diagnose orthostatic tachycardia or orthostatic hypotension without orthostatic vital signs. That sounds like a silly thing to say, but maybe Surprised at how many referrals I get for orthostatic hypertension where no one's actually documented that the pressure changes. Um, we often do some very basic blood work, a, a complete blood count and a basic metabolic panel just to rule out something grossly abnormal, severe. And autonomic reflux or function tests to make sure that there's not a problem of autonomic failure presenting this way. Um, we don't always do an echocardiogram, it's often it's been done. But what I would certainly argue that an assessment of cardiac function needs to be done. It can be a really good clinical exam if that's to document it's normal. I've had probably a few, but one I remember very well, a woman referred to me who developed POTS in pregnancy, and I sort of saw her a few months later, um, and referred by a cardiologist actually, but didn't have an echo, and you know, something seemed to be wrong, got an echo, and it turns out she had a peripartum cardiomyopathy, right? Which can also present with orthostatic tachycardia, but the underlying treatment is, is very different. Um, and it's important to exclude cardiomyopathy where the approaches should be targeting that and trying to restore cardiac function um, than just to say, oh, your heart rate's up, good for you. Um, we, uh, I guess because of our research interest in blood volume regulation, um, we're probably more aggressive about doing this in patients than, than others. Um, in a practical sense, it may address how aggressively you want to go after trying to restore blood volume. The truth is that the treatments are minimal for that. There's a handful of things you can do but all have potential side effects, and some patients don't want to consider certain drugs unless there's at least some reason to think that that might help. If we're gonna see patients over and over again, and there are a lot of patients we see sort of cross-sectionally as a consult because they're from far away, then we um, will often consider doing a formal exercise test. 
And part of this is to provide some objective basis for capacity of what you can do. Um, it's one thing to have someone come back and say, oh, I can't do this, I can't do that. But the problem is that we all know that people's reactions to what they can do can be different. Right? So some, if two people that can have the same functional capacity, some people will think they can do more and others will think they can do less. And this is a way of trying to get some objective data and numbers around that if you're tracking how someone's doing over time. So overall, the treatment approach involves three broad principles, not necessarily in this order. One is to focus on strategies to increase blood volume, and we'll talk about a few of them here. Um, two are hemodynamic agents, and, and the third is exercise. And I say not necessarily in this order, because I think exercise maybe should come first, and certainly at least concurrently with some of the others. So in terms of blood volume, I think you know, everyone gets the mother's milk advice in this community of, of increasing your water intake and, and taking in more salt, or almost everyone does. Um, Plutocortisone is an option. Plutocortisone is fake aldosterone, right, to try and encourage your kidney to retain more of the sodium. We talked about that a little bit earlier. That may be a problem in some patients. Um, and I'll touch upon IV saline and, and another strategy of desmopressin or DDAVP. So in terms of acute reduction of tachycardia, by far the best therapy that we have is the saline. Right, so if you infuse a liter or two of saline, that will make most people feel somewhat better, maybe not cure. Um, and this study was from Jerish Jacob uh, over 15 years ago now, that showed that uh, when given placebo, the heart rate didn't change that much. When given saline in one hour, the heart rate dropped from about 33 or 34 beats per minute increase to 15 beats per minute increase. And 15 is pretty much normal, close enough. All right, so acutely saline helps. Now, the problem with saline is getting it in. in my, that's not true. There are a few people that I've seen that get a, really, a whole lot of saline where it can actually start causing problems with renal function and all that, but most people that's not the issue. The problem is getting it in, right? Because you need to get intravenous access and you can only do that so long through a peripheral IV and then you put a central line in or not. And once you put a central line in, I think it's pretty much a question of when it'll get infected, not if it'll get infected. And so there are significant downsides to using this approach long term. However, I think it's a perfectly reasonable thing to keep in your back pocket for those times when you just decompensate and feel horrible, end up in the emergency room, you spend a few hours there, spend several thousand dollars of your insurance company's money, and now there's a quandary, right? They found nothing wrong, do they admit you or do they send you home? And certainly in that context, I would advocate going for a couple of liters of saline and seeing how you do before you get admitted, right? Because in many cases, not all, but in many cases, you will probably get better enough to feel like you can get out of the emergency room. So we're keeping in mind for, for emergent situations. So we, we've done a series of acute drug trials, so four-hour drug trials on, on our clinical research center at Vanderbilt. And one of, um, one of those drugs is, is a drug called desmopressin or DDAVP. So this is a, basically a drug that we give to little kids that wet their bed at night to get them not to do so. Right, so it's a drug that's been used, and it basically gets your kidney not to release free water. So you hold on to free water. Um, and what we found is that if you gave DDAVP with a glass of water, that while the carbon placebo group dropped a little, which we see in all of our studies, it dropped a lot more for the duration of the four hours with the DDAVP and placebo. So if you gave a little water and you got your kidney not to release it, hold on to it, that actually lowered the orthostatic tachycardia. Or in this case, the standing type. It's probably the standing heart rate. So the challenge with DDAVP is safety, or a concern about safety. So um, we've been pretty cautious about using it. My approach to using it has been um, as a pill in the pocket special event drug. Okay, so I mean, yeah, there are lots of some people use ecstasy. We use DDAVP. So, and by that I mean, you know. I think a lot of times, you know, one of the worst things about POTS is the unpredictableness of when you're going to feel horrible, and it becomes hard to plan events and go to events. Um, but if there is an event that you need to go to, wedding, you know, a liter of saline if you have access to it might be reasonable. But another approach that we've tried in a few people is to take, keep the DDAVP and use it just for that event. So it'll buy you four or five hours, perhaps, of slightly better controlled heart rate. Um, we've been very cautious with it. We've told our patients not to take it for the most part more than once a week. And if they are going to start doing it, to check their potassium. Because one of the concerns is that it can drive, by holding onto free water, you can dilute out your sodium. 
And I'm very concerned about taking a problem where you feel horrible and converting it to a problem where you might die. Okay? Now, we haven't seen that problem because we've been very, as I said, been very cautious with how we do use it. And you could rightly say, well, we give it to five-year-old kids, how bad can it be? The difference, of course, is we don't tell the five-year-old kids to drink lots of water. Right? And I suspect all of you have been told that. More recently, I, I've heard that Blair Grubb in Toledo has actually been using this more and has been using it daily in some patients. Um, and only one person has run it, and, 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 and really key in this is getting regular sodium checks. And only one person has run into problems, and that person took the, well, if one tablet's good, <laughs> or would be even better. Um, and, and so you have to be careful with the drug, but I mean, he started using it daily with some success in terms of holding on to the fluid. So it's another approach at volume expansion that can be tried. So what about the hemodynamic agents? What are you going to say about that? So mitogrin, um, this is the same study by George Jacob from, from a while ago. The SIBO data is exactly the same. And you see with mitogrin, it lowered the heart rate. It was statistically significant. We got a p-value on the correct side, 0.05. But the effect really was relatively modest. It lowered it from over 30 to under 30, but not rip-roaring. Now, part of the, the truth is maybe it's a question of, you know, some patients respond better or not. I know this is an in interest of some my colleagues um, that are trying to figure out if there's subgroups that respond better to my or not, but it's certainly an option there. It's not my first line option for most people, but it's in the armamentarium, it's a reasonable thing to do. It seems to provide a little bit of support. Um, so we're big proponents of beta blockers uh, in POTS, and this is actually surprisingly, to me, controversial in the autonomic community. I mean, so I think the arguments for it, I mean, I'm a cardiologist, I had a cardiologist that trained me from New Zealand who says if it moves beta blocker, you know, we that's what we do in cardiology. We give people after heart attack beta blockers and lots of it, and we love it. Um, the downside, you know, is that, you know, well, there are a couple of downsides. One, you know, Julian Stewart published a paper years ago arguing that IV esmolol, a particular beta blocker, didn't improve orthostatic tolerance acutely. Oh, we don't give IV esmolol. Um, but almost everyone that comes to us, and I suspect it's true for other physicians, complain that they're intolerant to beta blockers. Right? And we've heard that all the time. But, you know, we you know, had propranolol in this sort of series of drug studies that we did on our CRC, and, and the fascinating thing to us was that propranolol, 20 milligrams, almost always won, right? That was often the best drug, including in patients that don't tolerate beta blockers, right? We took the word, they knew we were going to try, they were willing to try a single dose of it, and almost everyone, this was the best drug. So the question then was why? You know, you see here, so placebo lowered the heart rate a little, but really propranolol lowered it a lot more, with the static tachycardia decrease, and we had symptom scores, oh, here it is, we had symptom scores suggesting that they were less symptomatic um, on standing you know, through the course of the study. So one of the things that we thought about, maybe it's dose, right? So we were giving a fairly tiny dose of propranolol, certainly less than I would give as a cardiologist to someone after a heart attack, and maybe people were just getting a starting dose that was too high for them, so they you know, wrote off the drug in the drug class. And in the same study design, we did a study with, we did day, a day with 80 milligrams per crown wall. And what we found is that the heart rate lowered and the blood pressure lowered even more, but the symptoms started, the symptom improvement started to disappear. People actually felt better on the 20 per crown wall than the 80 per crown wall, which provides more complete beta blockade. So I think the key to the per crown wall is that less is more. Right? The key is to give a low dose to take the edge off of the heart rate increase not to give a dose that's going to fix the heart rate. If you fix the heart rate, and, and we can, right? Those of us that prescribe it can give anyone here, including Dan, enough beta blocker that his heart rate will lower and be controlled. Um, he might not get out of bed afterwards. He'll feel horrible, but we can do it. So the key is to change your goal from normalizing the heart rate to taking the edge off the increase. So pyridostigmine uh, or mestinon is a drug that I think is, is used by a lot of people now. So this is a drug that inhibits acetylcholinesterase. Remember I said, when you release a neurotransmitter, you have to get rid of it. Acetylcholine is broken up by this enzyme called acetylcholinesterase, right? So it's a constant fight. You release acetylcholine, um, and it's trying to swim across to the postsynaptic junction, and these acetylcholinesterase are going around trying to gobble it up before it gets there, right? And some makes it, some doesn't. And so pyridostigmine basically inhibits this breakdown enzyme, so you end up getting more acetylcholine hanging around longer before it goes away. Um, and we thought that this works on both the sympathetic and parasympathetic, nerve, sympathetic nervous system of the ganglia, but postsynaptically only on the peripheral nerve, um, <coughs> parasympathetic nervous system, and so thought maybe 
lower the heart rate by increasing vagal tone effectively. And in fact, we were able to show it did increase heart rate on the CRC, on our unit, and improve symptoms. Life was good. The, real the reality is that I think it doesn't work quite as well as beta blockers in real life, but can be used in combination. And again, Blair, Robin Toledo has published a fairly large series of over 200 patients. Um, and the vast majority report, I think 60% thought they felt somewhat better with it. Um, but 20% didn't tolerate it. And almost always the reason for intolerance is that it increases gut mobility. So if you're prone to diarrhea, you will hate this drug. Okay. These drug studies? So, these, so the question was how long are these drug studies that I've been talking about? All of our drug studies are acute drug studies on the CRC. So from, uh, so the whole study is about six hours. Right, so obviously, you know, most people want treatment for more than six hours. Um, you know, but it may provide some guidance as to how you respond as a starting point. So Blair's data is less structured in terms of a study, but it's, it's his clinic experience. So his experience with peristigmine is probably over several months. I don't know if it's a set number of months, but he had people on it and at some point sort of assessed how they were. So um, I mentioned the norepinephrine transporter earlier in terms of the gene mutation and how drugs may be evil. Um, so we've actually done a study um, on this that was presented and, and has now been submitted for publication, looking at atomoxetine, which is an ADHD drug. It's the most pure norepinephrine transport blocker on the market in the US. And what we found is that like our other studies, the placebo um, lowered the heart rate a little bit, the standing heart rate. Atomoxetine increased it overall. This is the only drug that we've had that actually increased the standing heart rate. Um, also increased the seated heart rate, right? So there are challenges. The delta heart rate or orthostatic could increase, increase that as well. So all the things, the markers, the heart rate markers that we look for in POTS seem to get worse. And I guess more importantly, the symptom scores actually worsened with atomoxetine um, compared to the slight decrease that developed with placebo. So overall, you know, this confirms our bias that this class of drugs might not be an optimal class of drugs. Now, the truth, which isn't in here in another slide, is that there's probably a two-thirds, one-third response where one-third of patients didn't get worse and a few reported improved symptoms, right? So with anything, and that's something we may need to probe further, and this may relate to the variable net expression um, that I talked about the protein expression, although that's entirely conjecture and theory on my part. Overall, in our series, people got worse. So finally, um, a couple of words about exercise. I'm not going to say a lot because I think you have a whole other talk on this. But I don't think any of us were ever opposed to the concept of exercise. I think, you know, who's, who's going to say don't exercise, right? It's historically thought to be a good thing to be done. But the truth is that, you know, a lot of patients would laugh at us and tell us that you don't understand, I can't do it, and then, you know, we were sort of left in a quandary. So we have this sort of happy equilibrium where I would tell them to exercise, they'd say no, I'd know they wouldn't do it, we'd move on. <laughs> um, you know, but, but you know, it's worth noting that the people that did exercise over time seem to do better. Now the problem with that is, is that because of the exercise or is that because they can exercise? Is that just a marker that they're not as, as sick? So really, I think these questions uh, sort of trouble the field and, and haven't really, weren't really resolved until um, more recent data from many places, but largely the best data has been out of Dallas, where they did this exercise study with a very detailed before and after assessment in POTS patients. And so they did, some of the assessments were listed here, cardiac MRIs, exercise tests, traditional autonomic measurements, blood volume measurements. And they put them, the patient through a three month structured training program, um, and then assessed them again afterwards. And what they found is with the short term exercise training that you know, fitness level went up, well that's probably not a bad thing. Um, it increased blood volume, induced cardiac remodeling. So on MRI, cardiac mass increased in the three months. Um, it decreased sympathetic nerve activity, so we think this is a little, you know, excessive and high and that's driving the heart rate, well that lower. And it decreased orthostatic tachycardia. Um, now the, in fact I won't say any more about that because I suspect that I'm probably over. No, not yet. No? Okay. So uh, I'll say a couple things about that. Not too many things. <laughs> but the, key, the key is that most of our patients have a really high heart rate when they stand up. That's one. And the second thing is, you can do this, do this with your friends, right? If you say, I want you to go and exercise, and ask them what they think you said to them, like, what are they going to do? 
inevitably, treadmill, running, you know, maybe those evil elliptical things, you know, it's, it typically involves things that are upright. Almost, in fact, so far, always. I've never had anyone tell me in describing something that's not, that's not being upright. And that, I think, is the key problem, right? Because if you go on a treadmill and you're, you're five beats from your target heart rate before you turn the thing on, you're not going to last very long, you're not going to do very well, and you'll probably feel horrible and say that doctor's an idiot and go home and, you know, go find another doctor. Right? And so what I think the, the Dallas group did that was very clever is for the first month at least, and sometimes for several months of this exercise program, you were not allowed to do any upright exercises. So what they wanted to do, what they wanted you to do was use a rowing machine. You're squatted down, you're short, short from a gravity point of view, and you actually get some leg resistance, which is the other part of the program. If you hate rowing machines, you could swim, um, or you could use a recumbent cycle. So you're cycling with your legs, but you're basically lying down to try and decrease that. So all those heartbeats that are gonna go up and make you feel horrible, at least they're coming from the exercise, not from just the being up. So that was one part of it. But two, I don't want to make it sound like this was easy, right? They had to exercise four days a week. There was a trainer, you know, it's not the same as when I tell you, come to clinic, go forth and exercise. If you didn't show up on Tuesday, there was someone yelling at you saying, where are you, right? So there was the added motivation of, of pressure and fear. Um, because for this to work, you really had to do it and do it regularly. And the third thing is that the problem with exercise, I think, is that most people that prescribe exercise or tell you to exercise are fanatics. Right? They start talking about runner's highs, and I don't know where this high is, but I smacked into the wall, and I can only imagine it's on the other side of the wall. Okay? I think if people have this expectation, exercise will make them feel better, which is sort of the message that you get here. You may get them to go for a week. They feel horrible, and they say, well, you lied to me. The reality is, in this program, you feel horrible for the first month. Right? I mean, you, all the stuff that you probably experienced about how you feel with exercise, that's going to happen in the beginning the benefits didn't really start appearing until the second month. So I think part of it is you have to have a realistic expectation of when there's going to be benefit. Take it on faith that there's some payoff down the road, even though it's hard right now to imagine that it's coming. Okay, so a couple other things. A lot of patients um, that come to see me nowadays want to know what subtype of plots they have. Um, and there are colleagues of mine from different centers that will tell them they have this subtype or that, and we're starting to see papers describing this subtype or that subtype. I'm here to tell you right now it's all bunk. Okay? So I've gone through and described, you know, different pathophysiologies and concepts and things that we can research. But that's different than saying you have subtype X and you have subtype Y. So why is that? I think there are two challenges that I'll touch on. One is overlapping subsets and the other is lost in translation. So, overlapping subsets. So, I think when someone says, what type do I have? And they say, you have hyperabnergic pods, we have neuropathic pods. I think the assumption that's implicit, do you have a question or? The, the assumption that's implicit is that these are discrete subtypes. So if you have hyperabnergic pods, I say you have hyperabnergic pods, you don't have neuropathic pods, and vice versa. Or hypovolemic pods, whatever groups you want to come up with. And the reality is, that's not true. The truth is that it looks, the Venn diagrams look more like this. So Mayo, I know, has started publishing papers with, you know, certainly abstracts have come out with, you know, in neuropathic plots there's this, and hyperabnergic plots there's this. But if you look at their data closely, and if you talk to them, they readily will tell you this, that they defined neuropathic hyperabnergic plots however they defined it for that study, and they're entitled to do that, right? But if you look at, if you take the definition they use in the two studies, there are several people that have both. And that's what's not, that's not as clearly stated. So really what they're saying is, we're defining you based on this test being positive or negative. Or this, and that's fair enough, that's fine, that's fair to do, but that's not the same as saying, you are this discrete subtype and you are that discrete subtype. I think the more honest thing right now is to say, okay, we've done these four tests or five tests and this is, your profile is on these tests. And it may be that in a few years we better sort of segregate these groups. Right now there's a big overlap group depending on the criteria used. The other thing is that everyone in the POTS world is aware of these terms, hyperabnergic neuropathic. But if you go to four or five different POTS centers and ask their physicians, okay, when you say hyperabnergic POTS, how do you define it? What do you mean? You're going to get four or five different answers. I and mean, we've done that. I mean, as part of this, we're part of an autonomic rare disease consortium. And before putting in our grant proposal, we had two conference calls dedicated to trying to define this. And it was fascinating to hear people that are arguably the leaders 
in Pot's research use exactly the same terms to mean slightly different things. So I would argue that not only are these terms not helpful, they're potentially dangerous because it's a shorthand that Dr. A thinks means one thing, and then when you take that shorthand and go to Dr. B, they think it means something else. And they don't necessarily, if you don't look at what the data, the underlying data was, they may misconstrue that data. Okay, so at this point, I think I'd be careful about that. The other point is lost in translation. I don't know if you guys have seen this movie. It's the first movie I've ever seen with Scarlett Johansson in it. Um, <laughs> but, so I'm going to tell a story about nomenclature and what that means. So the story actually is one that I got from my mother-in-law, um, who is Indian and wears a sari. This isn't her. Um, she wouldn't let me use a picture of her, actually. Um, so she arrived, so she lived, grew up in England, or lived in England for most of her life, but moved back to India and was coming to visit us, and so arrived in Newark Airport with, with another, and they missed their connecting flight. And so she was in tow with another, you know, an old lady, a generation above her who spoke no English. Right, so imagine two sort of older Indian ladies sort of, you know, trudging around. And they went and said, okay, we need to get to the hotel. How do we go there? And um, so this lady at the counter said, well, go around the corner and there's an elevator and take that elevator up and then you'll see the, the little bus for the, the hotel. And so, you know, these two little Indian ladies with their big India suitcases, you know, trudged around and went around and circled around and came back and said, there's no elevator there. And you know, this lady said, no, go around, there's an elevator. And they went around, trudged around, came back and said, we don't see the elevator. Now this lady was getting upset, right? She was pretty confident there was an elevator there. And said, you know, go around, wandered around with them. And the problem was that in England, that's an elevator, right? We call it an escalator here. Uh, but my mother-in-law was looking for this thing. And in fact, this is called a lift in England. Okay, so again, sometimes very simple nomenclature things can get us into trouble. Don't be like my mother-in-law. <laughs> Take the lift. <laughs> okay, so what about um, the prognosis about POTS? Right? I mean, so people want to know, you know, what is the prognosis? And the truth is that I'm not sure that we have a good idea. I'm always fascinated when people say it has a benign prognosis, it doesn't have a benign prognosis. Most people get better. That may be true, um, but that's not what I see. And it may, but you know, I fully admit that hanging out at Vanderbilt, we get people from around the country, and that may not represent the average patient. The patient that's willing to come and fly to us and sometimes hang out in our room patient research unit probably isn't the same patient that's willing to take a few hours off work and drive downtown to spend a few quality hours, right? So, huge variability, but I would argue that almost every report suffers from a bias of some sort like that. Right, so I think it's very difficult to say. There are lots of different things that are this thing that we call POTS, and the prognosis becomes very difficult accordingly. So, we are um, trying to make a start at addressing that. Um, and it won't be an easy thing to address, but um, with a significant help from Lauren, we've been developing um, a web-based cross-sectional POT survey, For I think we couldn't come up with a fancier title. Um, the big POT survey. Uh, the big yeah, the big POT survey. <laughs> so um, this is something that'll probably take 30 to 45 minutes to complete with a bunch of questions addressing various issues that I think patients have raised about you know, doctor awareness, about comorbidity, about um, financial impact, both in terms of ability to work, direct medical costs, loss of relationships, to try and get a little bit of information on this. Not perfect, it can certainly be criticized because we are not, a lot of these patients aren't gonna be seen by anyone we know to say that they have POTS, but we're requesting that they at least have to say that a doctor is diagnosed them with POTS, right? I mean, they may be right or wrong. What we're hoping to be able to do is get a fairly large population, more than any one of our fairly active research programs could muster by themselves, and ideally patients that we might not see at our centers, um, to, try and, to try and get a sense of some of these questions. Um, this won't answer the prognosis thing, but I think this could lay the groundwork for sort of future sort of community-based studies to try and get a sense of what the prognosis is. Do two-thirds of patients really get better? Does it go away in most people? And it's very dispiriting for our patients because that doesn't seem to happen, and everyone asks, is it am I gonna get better? And usually I say no. Um, not completely. You can get better, but you're not going to get cured. 
And I've had patients, actually one patient went to Mayo afterwards and eventually came back a few years later and I saw the notes and said, why did you come here? I said, well, I asked Dr. Roger if I was going to get better and he said no. <laughs> was the reason. Um, but nonetheless, maybe that's just the subgroup I see. So hopefully we'll get more information. So this, you have this slide that lists some of the areas that we're trying to address in this questionnaire. If this works, this may be the beginning of a series of studies addressing more focused areas. Everyone has their pet areas, and even though the survey seems long, trust me when I say we had to prune it a fair bit to get down to this, because everyone wants their own ornament hanging. And hopefully this will be done as part of the Autonomic Rare Disease Consortium, but, but on a website near you. Um, and when you do see it, I'd encourage you to complete it. I'd encourage you to send the links out to your friends, even some of your enemies if you want. Um, <laughs> if the more data we get, I think it can only help us all. So the take-home message is the clots is a chronic disorder associated with significant functional disability, but it's not a disease. It's a syndrome. It's a bunch of things leading into it. Um, and I think part of what we have to do is understand that better. But the treatment principles are fairly standard for most. One is volume expansion, one is heart rate control, and perhaps most importantly in the long term is exercise. So, oh, the patient that we started with. So, she didn't like mitogrin, um, she complained of bugs in her hair, and somebody could have that. She didn't like Lorna, she was bloated. Apparently she was single and told me that the weight gain was not becoming on her and was interfering with her dating. Um, she did get on propranolol and sodium chloride, and, and I didn't get into this, but Yaz, birth control, actually, um, the progesterone agent is a spironolactone analog. It blocks aldosterone. So I usually encourage most of my patients to get off of that onto another birth control agent. Um, she takes DDAV for once in a while, and, and with this has actually been more functional. Um, had to quit her job. She couldn't continue her working job because of the brain fog, unfortunately, which we haven't treated. But she runs her own business from home, which gives her the flexibility to you know, work when she's not feeling particularly well. Thank you very much.